This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> well, praise the Lord, everyone. Thank you for joining the Sunday School of the Church of Jesus Christ. We are on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are on our pastor, Bishop John T. Leslie Jr. and Lady Louise Leslie, our assistant pastor, Jessica Robert Taylor, and Sister Melinda Taylor, our pastoral assistants, Evangelist Margaret Williams, Evangelist Doris Thompson, our Sunday School Superintendent, Deacon Frank Collins, and Evangelist Linda Collins. We'd like to greet you all in the mighty name of Jesus. And now at this time, I'll open up with prayer, and then I'll introduce our, our teacher. And then at 11.15, I'll be back with a few announcements, and then we'll uh, close it out. Now let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your goodness, and all your blessings that you bestowed upon us. We praise you for your mighty acts, for your excellent goodness. Lord, please, Lord, anoint each and every one of us, Lord God. Bless the teacher to give us what we need, Lord God, and help us, us, Lord, to be hearers and doers of your word, Lord. Help us, Lord, to hide your word in our hearts so we may not sin against thee, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' almighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you all. Our teacher today is Evangelist Alice Howard. She'll be our teacher today. Let's receive her at this time. God bless you, Evangelist Howard. Thank you, Elder Philip, and God bless you as well. Praise the Lord, Bishop Leslie and Lady Leslie, District Elder Taylor and Sister Taylor, Evangelist Williams, Evangelist Thompson, Deacon Collins and Evangelist Collins, and to the Zoom audience, praise the Lord. Our lesson today for those who um, have your Sunday school books, we are on page 130, lesson 10, February 5th, 2023. And our subject for today is blessing amid trials. Lesson text is found in James, first chapter, one through eight, 12 through 18. And our related scriptures, one is Matthew 4, one through 11, five, 10 through 12, First Peter 1 through 1, 3 through 9, 3, 13 through 18, and Revelations 2, 8 through 11. The time is AD 47, and the place is from Jerusalem. Our golden text reads as thus, blessed is the man that endure temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. That's found in James chapter 1, verse 12. Let's talk a little bit about the subject. Lessons is a favor or gift restored by God, thereby bringing happiness. And amid means surrounded by, in the middle of, for example, it says, Our dream house sat amid magnificent rolling countryside. Trials is a person or thing or situation that tests a person's endurance or forbearance. Suffering. James gave the suffering Christians a very strange message. He asked that they count it as a reason for joy when they experience difficult situations or trial. And he said, in the event that we do that, the blessing will be the crown of life. Is that I may know him. You know, one writer says that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Just like we suffer, Jesus also suffered. And the writer encourages us to know him in two ways. Know him in the power of his resurrection and know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. Some scholars, when it comes down to the book of James, some scholars say that James was the half-brother of Jesus. The Bible lists Jesus' brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And you can find that information in Matthew 13, 55. Now, James, he doubted his brother's claim to be the Messiah, but still followed him. You know, he was a witness to the resurrection. He became an apostle and a leader of the church in Jerusalem. He authored the epistle that bears his name, James. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, James was stoned to death by the Jews under the high priest in A.D. 62. When it comes to learning from the life of James, I think this is a good lesson. The brother Jesus, there's one thing that stands out about the rest, and it is this. The resurrected Christ has the power to change lives. 
I want to reiterate that the resurrected Christ has the power to change lives. Because keep in mind, James didn't receive, James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, you know, Israel's king, the anointed one, the Christ. He says, like the religious leaders of their day, James had seen Jesus perform countless miracles, but none of that convinced him that Jesus was the Messiah. But when he witnessed the resurrected Jesus, his entire life changed. He went from skeptic to believer to church leader. He witnessed the resurrected Christ. And I think what made the difference um, in James' life at that particular time was what Jesus had told him. He was a witness to it coming to pass. And if we hold on long enough, we will be a witness to those things that Jesus has shared with us. The epistle of James was written to the Jewish Christians of the first century AD, living in Gentile communities outside of Palestine. And James wanted to, to deal with several things that had, uh, had occurred um, in the church. So it says in an effort to expose hypocritical practices and to teach the right Christian behavior. What had happened, let me read this a little before I go into this. The letter is addressed to the 12 tribes and that's Just in Old Testament terminology, the term 12 tribes designates the people of Israel, the dispersion, or is considered diapora. And what that means is they were just dispersed from their original uh, homeland. It said it refers to the non-Palestinian Jews who had settled throughout the Greek Roman world. So James was dealing with those Christians that had both Greek characteristics and had Roman characteristics. So they started to practice things other than what the scriptures had, you know, asked them to practice, what the scriptures had instructed them uh, to practice. So what James decided to do, he was going to fulfill part of the Great Commission when Jesus told them to go forth, you know, teaching all nations, what they had seen and what they had heard. So James wanted to share with them what they had, what he had seen and what they had heard. He wanted them to be reminded of the teachings of Jesus opposed to the teachings of the Greeks and the teachings of the Romans because they were scattered about in Gentile nations. Now, the book of James is, um, is broken down in the following. It's the address, it's the value of trials and temptations, exhortations and warning and the power of prayer. So I'm going to read for you now James chapter 1 verses 1 through 8. James a servant of God in the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greeting. My brethren count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation knowing this that the trying of your faith work of patience but let patience have her perfect work, that ye might be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that watereth is like, is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind, and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So James refers to himself as a servant of God, a slave of God, a man that has committed himself to the works of God and to the word of God, a man who now considers Jesus his master, his Lord, and his savior. When, when you think about the mindset of a slave, in most cases, we would, let's just focus in a little bit on slavery. In most cases, slaves were afraid to disobey their master because they knew if they disobeyed their master that the outcome could be death. Well, here's the truth of the matter, church. If we disobey our master, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the outcome is still death. 
for the scripture teaches that the wages of sin is death. So it's no, it's no way of getting around it. What type of death? A spiritual death, the same death that Adam and Eve suffered and encountered when they were in the garden of, um, when they were in the garden of Eden, you know, when they disobeyed God. Now, again, James refers to himself as a servant of God. For this reason, and a lack of clues in the book of James, scholar, scholars debate his identity because how he addressed everyone, how, you know, the address, he says, I am, when he said, I am, but he introduced himself as a servant of God. The epistle states that it was authored by James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian tradition has held that this James, like Jude, is one of the sons of Joseph and Mary, and hence a half-brother of Jesus Christ. And this information can be found in Matthew 13:55, Mark 6:3, Galatians 1 and 19. James wrote to those Jews, and I went over this a little bit, who are scattered, possibly Christian Jews living throughout the Gentile world. The movement, the migration, or the scattering of people away from uh, an established ancestor homeland. So this is who he was writing to. And, and again, the word is pronounced diapera. The setting of scattered colonies of Jews outside of ancient Palestine after the Babylonian exile. The word, we're going to talk about various trials. The word temptation is sometimes used as a, a solicitation to sin as Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by the devil. He was tempted, you know, in the following areas, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. In addition, it can also be used as the trials we go through because of our faith. Those who will live godly, scripture teaches all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if we are living godly in Christ Jesus, we're going to suffer persecution. I remember Bishop Bell, the late Bishop Bell, in his teaching, he said he used to welcome his trials as friends. Like, come on, friend, sit down. I welcome you. He says, beloved, this is another scripture. It says, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But it tells us to rejoice in as much as you know you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Remember the writer says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Sometimes we lean more to knowing him and the power of his resurrection, but we don't want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. And unfortunately, that is part of our Christian lives. The trying of your faith has the capability of producing spiritual growth. Once we have encountered and overcome a trial, we are stronger because of the experience. Trials should not destroy us, but develop us. There are some things that people go through in the church and outside of the church that they just don't recover from. They just don't recover from. Well, in scripture, scripture teaches that we should be able through the Holy Spirit to recover from our trials and move forward with our lives. And sometimes that's, that's easier said than done, but it's possible. And let's talk a little bit about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Now, knowledge is acquired information and wisdom is how to apply that information. As Christians, as saints, as those who have been born again of the water and the spirit, we're in and out of Bible class, Christian education, you know, different services, we're reading our scriptures. So therefore we are acquiring information. Now it's extremely important 
what we do with that information and wisdom allows us to, uh, to, to make the right decisions when it comes down to that information. Wisdom, the Bible says wisdom is calling aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. This is in Proverbs and she's just looking for a mind to dwell in looking for knowledge, you know, to direct. And we need wisdom when we're going through our trials in this life. It is moral discernment that, this is what wisdom is, it is moral discernment that enables the believer to meet life in its trials with decisions and actions consistent with God's will. Sometimes trials would just throw us completely off. And we would try to address those trials, not according to the will of God, but not according, not according, you know, to holy men or, you know, godly counsel, but we'll, we'll go outside of that realm and we'll seek information from other people to try to address our circumstances and our trials. But the Bible admonishes us to let wisdom help us, let the Holy Ghost help us so that we can react to trials according to the will of God. You know, it has been said, it's not what we go through, but it's how we go through it. We need wisdom in order not to blame God for life circumstances that find their way into our lives. We need wisdom so that when we are feeling our deepest pain, we will not walk away from God. Trials will push you sometimes if you're not careful and if you're not grounded and if you're not rooted, trials will push you away from God. Our deepest pains will push us away from God. And, and, and it's nothing wrong with talking to God because it's, he's our father. I find nothing wrong with asking God, you know, why did this happen? Some people don't feel that way. But if we can't talk to, to God, if we can't talk to our father about our deepest pain, who could we talk to? Jesus did it. And the God that considered me when he knew that God was about to leave him and he knew that the sins of the world was going to rest on him, he had to talk to God. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but he realized that it wasn't possible that that cup was not going to pass from him. Some things will not pass from us. God help us all, but some things would not have passed from us. So Jesus had to settle down, but the only way he was able to settle down, according to scripture, the Bible says God sent angels to minister strength unto him. Sometimes God has to send angels to minister strength to us in our deepest pain. If prayers are to be answered, let's ask in faith. Now, when, we, when, we, when we're talking to God about our trials and our tribulations, when we're talking to God, you know, about the circumstances that have come into our life for whatever reason, whether they're circumstances that we brought on ourselves, whether they're circumstances that came into our lives because of just living godly, or whether they're circumstances that came into our lives because they were destined to come into our lives because of who we are, you know, and our family members and things of that nature. We, if we're praying about it, we have to pray and want to receive the answer through faith because without faith it's impossible to please God and there's some things that we're just not we're just not going to understand and it's hard to comprehend so sometimes we just got to believe God and we have to trust in God he says if our faith wavers we are like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and toss. Scripture teaches for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. God don't, and I'm not saying God don't know what to do for us because he don't know because he's omniscient. But when, when, when you bring your situation before a person, you have to be able to say what it is you want. When, when my son 
sons come to me or my children come to me and they want something, they have to be clear in what it is that they're asking me. They can't waver as to whether they want that thing or not because then they become double-minded. And you know, I'm like, well, what is it that you want me to do? So when 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 you come to God, he already knows what it is, but you got to say to him what it is that you need him to do. And you have to hold on to that in faith. And you can't be double-minded. Because when you're double-minded, you're unstable in all your ways. Because you can't make a decision. It says a double-minded, a, a double-minded literally means two souls. It is as if a person had two minds living in one body. The one is turned Godward while the other is turned toward the world. The one believes God, but the other disbelieve, disbelieve God. So you can't be double-minded. I'm going to read um, Preserving in Trials, James 1, 12 through 15. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when, is he, when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bring it forth death. The crown of life, also called the modest crown, um, is referred to in James 1 and 12 and Revelations 2 and 10. It is, it is bestowed upon those who persevere under trials. Jesus references this crown when he tells the church in Smyrna, to not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Don't be afraid when uh, we suffer or what we are about to suffer, and suffer because again, suffering is a part of um, this Christian life. But the race isn't given to the swift nor the strong, but to the one that endure to the end. So we have to endure to the end. And when you find yourself in a situation where you feel like you can't make it through, that's when we got to trust in God. I know some people, they say, well, right now is not the time to, to talk to them about God. Right now is, is not the time to talk about scriptures. Right now is not the time to tell them to praise God. It's just not the time. Let them, let them grieve, let them moan, let them hurt, you know, let them face what they're going through. But the Bible tells us that, you know, God is our strength. And it tells us to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And yes, we might not be able to call on Jesus and praise him like we normally can. But if we can just muster enough strength in our mind to thank Jesus. Just to, just, just to thank Jesus, just to, just to say, Jesus, God is wise enough to interpret our thoughts. God is wise enough to interpret what we're trying to say to him if we just say Jesus. Because if we say Jesus long enough, God's going to show up because he, he dwells in the midst of the praises of his people. He's going to show up and he's going to help. One thing you can always, always count on is that God's going to help you. The Bible tells us he'll neither leave us nor he will, nor will he forsake us, that he is our banner, he's our buckler, he's our shield, he's the lifter up of our head, that is who he is. So when we're going through and we're questioning why we're going through, concentrate on the scripture. I don't care what nobody else tell you. We can't walk away from God and think that we're gonna make it. And I'm not and I'm not saying that we can't sorrow for a moment. That's not what I'm saying. You know, but don't don't stay there. Ask God for help. It says, while it is true that temptations come upon us all, it is equally true that God does not send them. God does not tempt us. 
God does not send temptation. You know, we pray that we enter not into temptation. Sometimes we're drawn away, you know, by our own lust. It is true that in his sovereignty and omniscience, he allows them to occur, but he is not the source of them. Some of our trials come from our own bad decisions, our faith in Christ, um, Satan, the tempter, and our inner sinful desires. James was adamant that we should not blame God when we are tempted. If for some reason you find yourself blaming God, if for some reason we find ourselves blaming God, God help us to to, and forgive us, you know, for, for, for that state of mind, because we know that you are God of love and we know that all good gifts come from you. It is though our desires, it is through our desires that we are frequently enticed. Christ stressed the same truth when he said in an evil action, originates in an evil heart so a lot of times is what's in our heart and i'm telling you when you're going through it's going to show what's really in your heart when 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 that deepest pain comes forth it is going to show what's really in your heart but again we can't blame god all right so i'm going to read perfect gifts from above james 1 16 to 18 scripture lesson text outline do not err my brother my beloved brethren every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from above and cometh down from the father of lights which whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures god is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He doesn't waver. He knows what he's going to do, when he's going to do it, and how he's going to do it. There is no darkness in him whatsoever. When God shows up on the scene, it is strictly light. It is strictly light. He brings no darkness with him. It is strictly light. You know, we, we are begotten through the word of truth. The Bible says you should know the truth and the truth will make you free or set you free, right? It's the truth. It's the truth of, of the word of God that allowed us to call upon the name of the Lord or allowed us to, to repent of our sins and, and want to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. This is what God did. God, God sent back the Holy Ghost, you know, as, as a comforter because he knew that we would face trials. He said, I'm not going to leave you confidence. I'm just, I'm just not going to do, do that. I'm going to send back the Holy Ghost. And one of the things that the Holy Ghost is going to do is it's going to comfort you. James warned the brothers, the brothers that to go astray in their thinking. The enemy it, that's one of the tactics of the enemy is to attack our thinking or to attack what God has said to us, just like he did Adam and Eve. Did God really say that? You know, um, should I really trust in God through my trials and tribulations when I'm feeling like uh, I can't make it? Should I just go ahead and and give in and, and, and throw up my hands. You know, he, he comes to, to make you think like that. But, but we have to some kind of way, and I believe that is done through the Holy Spirit and the word of God because the Holy Spirit is our helper. We have to muster up enough strength to say I'm more than a conqueror. Even though I've been faced with these things, these things that I might consider unfair and look at myself and say, I'm going through more than, the, than this person's going through. I'm living the best life that I think I could live and all the suffering is coming on me. And I'm looking around, you know, at the people in the world or even some of the people in the church are that are hypocritical and just living any kind of life. And, and it doesn't appear that they're going through anything. But I want to share this with you. The first law of psychology is this. Things are not always the way they appear to be. We can't just look at a person, just assume that they're not going through, through something because we don't know what they're going through because their weakness might be our strength. 
and our strength might be their weakness. James teaches that all good and perfect gifts come from our heavenly father. And they do. He don't, he don't want us to get off track and, and, and start blaming God, you know, for the, the wrong things that are going, in our, going on in our life. Even if we're suffering uh, persecution because we are uh, living a right life. The, 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 the student is not greater than the teacher, you know, nor the servant than the master. Jesus went through. We're not greater than Jesus. He went through. You know, we're not greater than Jesus. So we got to keep that in mind. In essence, James taught that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is. There's no changing in him. James ends his message with the fact that God chose us. We did not choose him. It was the word of truth that he breathed life into our hearts and in our minds. And when we feel like we can't make it through or we feel like we're being tempted, you know, uh, with a temptation that seems unbearable. Know this, that he breathed life into us. So there's no death in us unless we sin. So the Holy Ghost is the life in us. So when we feel like we did, glory, when we feel feel like we did and we can't make it through we are so much alive in christ there's so much life in our hearts and in our minds and the enemy don't want us to believe that he don't want us to hold on to that but that is truth that that is truth that is definitely truth that there's so much life that is in us. You know, perfect gifts now, you know, we, we caution against um, deception. The devil comes to deceive us. And, and we, we've got to be, we're, we're smart enough to know who we are, you know, in Christ. We're smart enough to know who we are in Christ. We, we're not just anybody. We're not a Johnny come lately that is not who we are but I'm, i want to go ahead and I'm, i want to read um the perfect gifts from above james 1 16 through 18. this slide is up but i'm going to read this i think i did read it do not err my beloved brethren every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and coming down from the father of light so i did read it so what what i un want, want us to understand is when he talks about the crown of life he's talking about a crown that's waiting for us he's talking about actually having um eternal life he's talking about living with christ forever not not just one day so even though we're going through in this life we have something to look forward to we have a hope beyond the grave. Our loved ones have a hope beyond the grave. So the Bible teaches us that we don't sorrow as some. Yes, we sorrow, but we don't sorrow as some because we have a hope beyond the grave. And when we're going through, we shouldn't, even though sometimes we do, be so disappointed when we think we have nothing to live for because we do have something to live for. We can live to see Jesus again. He's going to come back. If, if, if we stand still, if we hold on, if we fight a good fight of faith, we're going to make it. If we believe that God's able to do exceedingly abundantly above whatsoever we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, we're going to make it. 
We're not going to be losers. We are not losers when we are dealing with our deepest pain. We're still not losers when, when the tears are rolling down our eyes. We're still not losers when we don't have as much money in our bank accounts that we think we should have. We're still not losers. Why? Because of the Holy Ghost that dwells on the inside. So don't think it's strange the fiery trials that come upon us as though some strange thing happened to us. And just keep in mind that God does not, he does not tempt us. He didn't tempt Jesus. God uh, put examples in the Bible so that we can live by. He did not tempt Jesus. The Bible says Jesus was led in the wilderness to be tempted of who? The devil, the tempter, the accuser of the brethren, the one that's always bringing thoughts to our minds and, you know, putting temptations in our way, you know, just to bring us down. That's who is responsible, even though, and you hear this a lot, well, God is God. Why did he allow this thing to happen? That's what you hear all the time. But yes, he's God. And yes, he could have stepped in and he could have stopped it. But this is what I want to share, you know, because because I, I, th I think about this a lot. This is what I want to share because God can step in and, and stop things. But some things... If not all things, well, I, I, I feel safe in saying some things were destined before the foundation of the world. You know, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes talks about that. It's a time to cry, it's a time to smile, it's a time to live, it's a time to die, it's a time to mourn, it's a time to be happy. Those are the things that, that we have to uh, in, encounter. Those things were destined before the foundation of the world is appointed unto man wants to die, then the judgment. So can we really, you know, blame God for anything? Jesus' coming was, was destined before the foundation of the world. God knew that Adam and Eve was going to sin. And he knew that the whole world was going to go into, you know, the state of sin because of the one man's disobedience. So he already had a plan in place before the foundation of the world. You know, in Jeremiah, it tells us that he knew us even before we were, you know, shaping in our mother's womb. He can conceive. He knew us. He knew us. So he knew how our life was going to unfold. He knew how our children's lives were going to unfold. He knew that the tempter was here. Yes, God created good. Yes, God created evil. But the Bible tells us that he set before us life and death. And he just didn't set before us life and death, but he gave us the answer. He said, choose life. Choose life. Choose to live. So when you're going through temptations, you know, and in our deepest pain, we have to choose to live. You know, the, the, the Jews that were scattered abroad, they had really gotten all trapped because of the, the Greek teachings and, and the Roman teachings. And there's so many teachings in this world, Lord help us all. But we gotta stick close to God and we've gotta stick, you know, close to the Bible, the word of God. And we've gotta be strong in our, in our trials our tribulations and that don't always uh happen overnight but what i want to say to the church is this let's help one another james took out the time when he saw or got word of of, of what the uh the jews that were scattered abroad what they were going through he took out the time and he sat down and he pinned he started writing to them, you know, trying to put them back on track, trying to share some information with them. When people are going through, when we're going through, let's be kind to one another. Let's share information with one another. Let's seek God for wisdom on how we deal with ourselves, our trials, our tribulations, and how we deal with the trials and tribulations of our sisters and our brothers. Because scripture teaches that we've got to bear one another's burdens, but it also speaks to that individual and tell them they got to bear that burden too. 
but we don't want to leave them alone. We want to bear that burden with them. If we see a sister or brother overtaken in the fault, you know, those that are spiritual, help us, you know, to restore that one in a spirit of meekness and considering ourselves, least we fall, because there are some saints that are overtaken by temptation, but we don't want to leave them there. We want to have the same mindset that James said and say, brethren, do this. Brethren, don't go astray in your thinking. Brethren, don't accuse God. Brethren, when you're going through, count it as joy. Come on, that's joy. Why? Because the, the joy of the Lord is our strength. That's why he's telling us account it as joy. He's not saying be happy about it. I don't have to be happy about it, but I know if it comes my way, then the joy of the Lord becomes my strength. Now I can count this thing as joy. Why? Because I've got the Holy Ghost. I've got the Holy Ghost. I've got the spirit of God that's living on the inside. You know, I've got the word of God that I'm casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, but bringing that thing into captivity until the obedience of Christ, until God steps in and God makes the difference because I'm telling you, if you hold on, if we hold on, because I'm talking to myself as well, if we hold on, we will be able to endure temptation. We will be able to resist the devil when he comes because the Bible tells us if we resist him, that he's going to flee from us. But if we entertain him, he's going to deal with those thoughts. And he's going to keep working on them and working on them and working on them. We have to know our enemy because our enemy looks for that weak spot. You know, think about think about um, boxing when somebody's boxing and they're looking for their component's weak spot. And when they find that weak spot, they just keep hitting it and hitting it and hitting it and hitting it. And what happens? It brings them down. It brings them down. And see, and that's how the enemy is when it comes down to temptation. He looks for our weak spot so he can keep hitting it and hitting it and hitting it. And eventually he's going to bring us down. But when he looks for our weak spot, this is what he has to find. He has to find Jesus. He has to find us somewhere calling on the name of the Lord. He has to find us somewhere reading the word of God. He has to find us somewhere in a Bible class or, 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 or a church service. He has to find us somewhere engaged in a conversation where we're talking about God. I don't care if it's as simple as Jesus is Lord. If it's as simple as I'm going to make it. If it's as simple as I can go through this. If it's as simple as I'm hurting, but I know who can who can heal my heart. I'm not saying we have to read a sit down and read a whole chapter. Read one verse of a sentence and watch the word of God come alive in our lives and, and give us strength and make us strong and we can run on another day. I, I, I said this and, and, I, and I say this over and over. You used to hear people say, take it a day at a time. Sometimes you can't even take it a day at a time. You got to take it a moment at a time. Sometimes you can't even take giant steps, but you just got to move. If you just can move your foot, if you can just hold on, you know, for a second. And then if you find yourself drifting, regroup, regroup. Stop being afraid to talk to people. That's, that's the enemy trying to keep us away from one another to ask for help. And when people talk to us, let us deal with that person according to scriptures. And, 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 if, and if they need help, let us let us help them. But we ain't always got to broadcast what we're doing. We ain't supposed to let our right hand know what our left hand is doing and vice versa. But but hold on. Just just hold on when temptation comes. And don't don't think it's strange and just count the joy. You can count the joy because, you know, you're going to get a crown of life if we just hold on and count it joy. Okay, Elder Philip, I'm going to turn this back over to you. But one of the principles that I, that I do want to talk about, uh, uh, or, or theological principle, something that can pass 
from you know one dispensation to another dispensation. I want I'm gonna talk about several. One is this: remember this that God does does not change. He's saying yesterday, today, and forevermore. And the other one is God cannot lie. He didn't lie in a dispensation of innocence, and he's not lying now in a dispensation of grace. He was the same in the dispensation of innocence as he is in the dispensation of grace. You know, he's still about redeeming, 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 you know, redeeming us um, from the hand of the enemy. Still, still redeeming us from the hand of the enemy. Still redeeming us, still redeeming us from the hand of the enemy. So we just have to hold on to, you know, God. All right. Okay. Thank you, Vengeance Howard. Another Are powerful right? Sunday school lesson. Thank you so much. Blessings amid trials. My yeah. Lord. Amen. All right. You can mute yourself now, Vangelis Alice. <laughs> I'm happy. All right. Join us at 1130 a.m. for our tap-in service. We're going to have a great time in the Lord. You have time to make it. So join us at 1130 a.m. today for our in-person service. Monday through Friday, we have early morning prayer at 6 a.m. The call-in number is 716-427-1128. The access code is 563276. Join us Tuesday for Bible study at 8 p.m. using the same meeting code, access code, telephone number that you use for this session. Also, our Bible class will be streamed on our Facebook channel. So join us this Tuesday at 8 p.m. for Bible study. All are invited. All are welcomed. Join us Wednesday for early morning prayer with the PCAFI at 6 a.m. The call-in number is 844-992-4726. The access code is 132-913-0943. And then we have Thursday prayer, Thursday evening at prayer, uh, 7.30 p.m., 716-427-1128. Access code is 563276. All are invited, all are welcome to all of these services that we have. All right, and the women will be in prayer this Saturday. At 10 a.m., all women are invited and all women are welcome to attend the prayer Saturday morning at 10 a.m. The meeting code is 847-7121-3439 and the passcode is 808918. All women are invited and all women are welcome to join this prayer at 10 a.m. on Saturday. And also on Saturday, we have Sunday school for our school-aged children for grades one through four, grades seven through eight, and grades nine through 12. Sunday school for our school-aged children on Saturday, beginning at 12 noon. Now, we'd like to thank you for all of your support. We are receiving your support. Those that are giving online at cojc.org, those that are using the Giveify app, those that are mailing it in, and those that are dropping it off, thank you for your continued support. Now let's stay connected. We are on Twitter, COJC underscore DC. Facebook is COJC Wash DC. YouTube is COJC Multimedia. Our website, COJC.org. And our radio broadcast every Saturday at 1.30 p.m. Our pastor is preaching and teaching the word of God. These are your announcements. God bless you all. Love you all. Now let's receive Deacon Collins for final remarks and the benediction. Deacon Collins. Praise the Lord, Sunday School Scholars. We thank the Lord for another powerful lesson this Sunday that the Vandals Howard had taught. Praise God. Vandals Howard started this train on last week. Praise God. And uh, just as a reminder for everyone, the unit of study that Evangelist Howard has been working in is the blessings of being members of Christ's body, the church. And as I said, praise God, she started last week with working on this thing. One thing that she highlighted in part of what she was around and uh, wrapping up with, pray God. Saints, last week's lesson and this lesson, the Lord was working on us to not have no weak spots, praise God. We, as a people of God, should have taken both of these lessons in a personal kind of situation, praise God, in order to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. What I see and I'll share this with you as a superintendent, praise God, with these two particular lessons that she's taught. 
It's a system of checks and balances that she's been teaching about, praise God. From last week's lesson to where the Lord started out talking about body parts, nose, hand, feet, praise God, ears, and not one part looking at another part as being inferior, praise God. And the whole uh, story about what was being taught with that actually went from our body parts to our brothers and sisters. I say, touch your neighbor. It went from our body parts to our brothers and sisters, praise God. huh? And each one of us preferring another better than our, ourselves, praise God. A terrible weak spot that we have as a people of God, if we look back at last week's lesson, praise God, is always thinking that you can do it better than someone else, praise God. huh? But she taught us in such a way that we learned to stay in our lane. Stay in our lane, praise God, and the gifts that God has given to someone else, praise God, it'll help perfect you, and it'll help you settle yourself down, praise God. Hmm? What a powerful lesson as you start uh, continuing on this week. Blessings amid trials, praise God. Still, which is personal, praise God, in order to build our ourselves up in the most holy faith, still dealing, praise God, sconces, to where we keep ourselves in check and balance, praise God. The things that we go through as a people of God, tests, trials, temptation, praise God, when you look at today's lesson that she taught, all of these things, I say all of these things, praise God, God perpetually send them our way. I say he perpetually continually send them our way, praise God. Hmm? And you say, you ask yourself the question, why does he do that? Well, he does it, praise God, because he's building us up in the most holy faith, huh? Because as tests, trials, and temptation come our way, praise God, it helped to build us up. And in this lesson, as it points out, praise God, it helped us to give us patience. Did you all hear what I just said? It helped to give us patience, praise God. Remember what the scriptures say, in, in patience, possess you your soul. If you don't have any patience when you're going through in tests and trials and temptations or whatever, you'll soon throw your hands up. You'll soon throw in the towel, praise God. What a powerful lesson. In the same lesson that she taught, praise God, talking about if in and lack wisdom, we all lack wisdom. So we don't understand sometimes the test, the trials, the temptations that we go through. God is opening up, and he says, if you lack wisdom or if you want to know, ask me, praise God, and I'll show you. And God will show us what he's doing for us, building us up in the most holy faith, praise God. And the last part I think that I want to touch on, praise God, that was in this lesson, not wavering. The Lord is teaching us through these tests, through these trials, that we are blessed, not wavering, praise God. We can't believe God this 15 minutes in the next 15 we scratched our heads and we don't know whether or not to be in the Holy Ghost. Help me, Lord Jesus. Huh? God is working on us. I see you working on us, praise God. He wants you, he wants me, and everybody else, praise God, to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. And the way we do it is when tests, trials, and temptations come our way, praise God, we embrace what he said. Lord, have mercy. Did you all hear what I just said? When tests, trials and temptation come our way, hmm? we have to embrace God's word, praise God, hmm? and he'll keep us from falling. Lord, have mercy. I'm going to stop right there, praise God, but as Benjamin House said last week, praise God, 45 minutes sometimes is not enough for these lessons, praise God, hmm? but I hope you're doing just like Bishop Lester tells us, praise God. Get your notepad and get your pens out, praise God, as the teachers of history lesson. I say not just for a history lesson, but this, praise God, is for us in order to help to perfect ourselves in Christ Jesus. Lord, have mercy. Next week's lesson, stay tuned, praise God. Next week's lesson, the subject is blessing of God's comfort. And we'll be in 2 Corinthians, first chapter, verses 3 through 11, praise God. Let's bow our heads in the word, with a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, you know that we need you every step of the way, every turn, oh God. Lord, help us to not be hearers of your word, 
but help us to be doers, oh God. And the people that you're calling for, bless every home that's represented here, every he ear that's here and praise God, fill us up in the most holy faith. Help us to be what you're calling for in these last and evil days. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody say amen. Amen. Peace be unto the saints. Peace be, Peace be multiplied.